Hey guys, Lady here, and welcome back to the series of analyses on the Persona 5 characters and how they represent their respective tarot archetypes, this time featuring the Empress and the Emperor Arcana. Now before we begin, I'd like to explain a few of the Jungian ideas that are relevant to this video. Though, if you'd like to know more about the full in depth, you can find that in the first video of the series linked in the cards above. But with all that said, let's dive right in. The overarching themes of the Persona series are based off of Carl Jung's ideas, including those such as the collective unconscious, archetypes, and the use of the tarot to symbolize a person's path to wholeness. Jung proposed that we are all born with the collective unconscious, an entity that contains the shared memories and ideas across all of humanity. Just as there are similar myths and legends across all cultures, there exist the archetypes that manifest as the persona we use in the game. Archetypes are certain idealized images of a person or role that transcends cultures and time periods. So in relation to the tarot, each of the major arcana promotes this concept of an individual who begins as the Fool card, gaining wisdom, experience, and essentially a soul through the process of encountering each one of the tarot archetypes. In Persona 5's case, this is symbolized via the relationships Joker establishes and nurtures with his confidants. Lastly, before we move on to discussing the Empress Arcana, I'd like to go over the Jungian concept of the anima and animus. In their most basic form, animus refers to the traits we traditionally associate with masculinity, while the anima refers to those which we associate with femininity. Any one person can become a more fulfilled version of themselves if they find a balance between the anima and animus. For example, a traditional male can better develop his empathy, a normally feminine trait, if he finds balance with his anima. So with this concept in mind, the third and fourth arcana, like the first two, are closely tied to each other. In this case, the Empress represents the feminine energy, while the Emperor represents the masculine. So continuing off of the last video, we've now arrived at the Empress archetype, represented by Haru Okumura in P5. The Empress is the archetypal motherly role in the tarot and teaches the fool the joys of nurturing others and of the great happiness found in supporting those around us. This is most notably seen early on during the Fifth Palace arc, where Haru saves a struggling Mona and ends up supporting him to the best of her ability, ultimately having his best interest in mind. The way she stands up for Mona, albeit indirectly, when approached by Makoto and Joker really struck me as what an ideal motherly figure would do. You see, even though Haru was misguided in her thought process, she found it odd that Mona was all alone in her father's palace while his teammates appeared to have no regard for his safety. She took on that role of unconditional love and support to the feline during a time where it seemed no one else would. And forgive me for this kind of crass analogy, but it kind of reminds me of that whole only a mother could love that face saying, and that Haru was sticking by an otherwise very difficult individual. And then we get to the part where Mona shares all his inner demons with the PT. Haru's actions are exactly the kind of nurturing love and care that comes from the ideal motherly figure. She displays a maternal kind of intuition and can tell what Mona's really thinking deep down. So she gently admonishes him for not sharing the entirety of his feelings with his friends. And thanks to Haru's encouragement, Mona blurts out the entire truth, that he really does want to stay with the Phantom Thieves. On another note, 
The upright empress also symbolizes diplomacy and the ability to create a welcoming space for others to share their own feelings. You know, like how mothers are often viewed as the mediators of their households, such as when they make sure all the siblings find a way to share their toys and compromise with each other. I really do think this whole fiasco between Mona and the rest of the PT would have dragged out for way longer if the Okumura heiress hadn't stepped in like she had here. But now moving on to Haru's confidant, we can see how it's also greatly influenced by the Empress Arcana, like how her tending to the crops in the garden allude to the maternal joy of bringing life into the earth. But her confidant is also where the reverse aspects of the Empress is featured most prominently, such as spending too much time meeting the needs of others while neglecting one's own. One of the main reasons Haru teams up with Mona initially is to investigate the rumors about Okumura Foods and its abusive practices. And then there's this big dichotomy of her relationship with Mona. Like on one hand, it's touching how much she cares about fulfilling his needs, but on the other, it's quite sad seeing her focus on that while neglecting to address the legitimately abusive relationship her father is pushing on her. Which brings us to how Haru's arc explores the concept of filial piety, mukoyoshi, and just how far she's willing to go to honor her father. I go into much more detail on that in my Haru character analysis in Japanese context video, which is linked up in the cards by the way. But yeah, so the reverse empress gets carried away with loving without any limits, manifesting in Haru's arc as her willingness to go along with this arranged marriage solely to fulfill her father's aspirations and basically putting up with a horrible fiancé. Or well, until she decides she's had enough and finally gets in touch with her own personal wishes for once. So overall, Haru encompasses the motherly archetype that showcases what unconditional love looks like, though not to the extent of being a detriment to one's own well-being. We can see how Haru just wanted her father to realize his wrongdoings and take responsibility for them. She didn't want to take revenge or wish badly on him, but rather just hoped he could become a better person. Through her unconditional love she shows Mona, we see how the upright empress teaches the fool to nurture the dreams of those he cares about and to support them in their endeavors. So now let's move on to the masculine counterpart to the Empress, the Emperor. This is the archetypal fatherly role in the Tarot and, in brief words, teaches the Fool about power and order. The Emperor provides structure and discipline, as in, he imposes rule for the sake of peace and harmony. With these things in mind, Yusuke is a rather unconventional look at this archetype, especially when compared to his brethren in the previous Persona games. Like, Akihiko and Kanji encompass the typically masculine image, what with the emphasis on their physical prowess, Akihiko and boxing, for example. But despite this, Yusuke still symbolically embodies this emperor archetype, starting with the insane amount of discipline he practices to hone his craft. Art is essentially the only thing he thinks about, to the point where he's willing to sacrifice food for it. Yusuke's gameplay also reflects the sort of one-track-minded precision with his kit's focus on crits and setting up very specific situations to amplify his damage. And, just in general, he imposes very strict principles on himself, which usually results in living in extremes, like spending the rest of your money on buying lobsters, not to eat, mind you, but for reference practice for his art. And speaking of which, the crazy amount of discipline required to practice art every single day 
ends up encroaching upon other areas of his life, such as the rigidity of his thinking in general. You see, during the Second Palace arc, Yusuke demonstrates a very black and white view of the world. He starts off with the belief that his sensei is faultless, and vehemently denies any allegations that Madarame may be up to no good. It's to the point where Yusuke is the only pupil of Madarame's who has stayed behind. Though, once the truth is revealed, Yusuke's entire worldview does a complete 180, with him now believing his sensei is irredeemable and is a stain upon true art. And then on this note, we've arrived at the Reverse Emperor, and how it can rear its ugly head when he starts placing too much stock in controlling his environment and imposing order upon his world. Instead, the Emperor must learn that the reality of life is not all things can be managed or placed into neat little boxes. Yusuke's confidant and its exploration of duality really is a great example, albeit a rather unconventional one, of the Emperor's dilemma, and how he must reconcile the inherent contradictions in the world. Yusuke ultimately comes to understand and accept that there's a kind of duality to everything, especially in regards to Madarame. Like, for example, he apparently never treated Yusuke harshly, though at the same time, this doesn't justify the material neglect Madarame allowed at his shack, especially since the man clearly had the finances to provide more, nor does it justify him taking credit for Yusuke's work. But then Yusuke learns from Kawanabe about the time Madarame was legitimately concerned about his health when he once ran a high fever. Coupled with Sojiro's thoughts as an adoptive parent himself, in that he believes there's a part of Madarame that truly did care for Yusuke, or else he wouldn't have looked after him all this time, all of these are difficult, contradictory ideas that Yusuke eventually has to come to terms with in order to arrive at a healthier state of mind. One that is free to pursue art wholeheartedly once more. And with that philosophical reconciliation, the Emperor's intense fixation on order and structure has been abated. So ultimately, the journey to this point encompasses an important aspect of the benevolent fatherly figure, since this archetype knows when and where are the proper times to assert his authority. By the end of his confidant, Yusuke has figured out which domains of his life to impose his self-discipline, i.e. mainly his art, and when to just accept things as they are. So, in conclusion, the Emperor teaches the full, valuable lessons on strength and how to properly exert authority and discipline in his life. So that about wraps up the second installment. I'd love to hear what you guys think about these two arcana, and let me know if you think I missed anything. Also, please give this video a like if you liked it to help me out with the algorithm and join our welcoming and active community on Discord. We'd love to connect, and also just follow me on Twitter and Twitch if you like. Finally, I want to give a huge thanks to all my patrons for their support, especially Jared Breland, Andreas Hansen, Captain Hobo, NT Luck, Big Clingy, Sam Bezjak, Thomas Perez Jr., Francesco Santoyo Rego, Silverwind847, Sathya Silveraja, M. Meowdalyn, Gigi Sora, Platinum Rose, and Malcolm Lowry. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and until next time, take care. See ya!